Uh, Dr. Billy, do you check if you are able to ch share your screen uh, and you know start your presentation? Just that's the only thing that is left. Sure. All right. Sure. Let's see. Do you have the rights to share? Because that's what we were having trouble with. Okay. So you have the right to see? share. Yeah. Oh, yeah. We can see that. Actually. Okay. Let me start Let again me. and make sure I'm sharing sound. Do you want to check if you're sharing? Oh, okay. Yeah. All right. Yeah. Just let me know uh, when to get started. Okay. Absolutely. Thank you very much. Um, all right. Uh, let me just um, start with obviously your. Uh, do we also have Dr. Arpita Goswami who has joined us? Uh, Dr. Goswami, have you joined us? Madhuri, uh, she is not supposed to present today. Oh, no, no. I was just asking whether she has uh, joined us. Like, I know she's not supposed to present. Anyway, <laughs> sorry for the confusion. Okay, thank you very much, everyone, for coming here. I'm really sorry for the delay that we had. We are usually very punctual about when to start our, uh, our uh, talks. But anyways, thank you very much for being here today. Let me quickly introduce you to our presenter for uh, tonight. This was a very uh, anticipated, this is a very anticipated talk, actually, because specifically for uh, an organization which is named the Society for Endangered and Lesser Known Languages, uh, to have the program manager at the Endangered Languages Project uh, present her work and her, um, her studies and you know, her education and knowledge with us is a huge deal for us, actually. And we are extremely thankful to Dr. Anna Blue for joining us here today. Uh, she has been working to support language revitalization and activism around the world as the program manager in uh, Endangered Languages Project. She's a linguist who focuses on language documentation, revitalization, and social linguistics with a focus on languages spoken in Cameroon, as well as global language endangerment. She has completed her PhD at the University of Hawaii at Manoa in 2020 with a dissertation on language shift and maintenance in Lhasa speaking communities. She currently lives in Portland, Oregon on the traditional territories of Chinook and Kalapuya speaking peoples. So it's an absolutely wonderful uh, mixture of things that, uh, that Dr. Blue has done. And I'm sure we will learn a lot from her um, presentation today. And uh, of course, I am very, very excited to listen to whatever she has to say. And I'm sure all of you are. We'll keep our questions to the end. Uh, if you want to ask a question, you can definitely ask her in the chat box or you are welcome to unmute yourself and then ask her question. But we would uh, prefer if you ask your questions in the end. Uh, but obviously, throughout the lecture, you are also welcome to uh, type out your question in the chat box. And we'll be absolutely delighted to take your uh, questions. Uh, or, about whatever Dr. Blue is going to present and talk to us about. Anyways, without any further ado, let me start, um, uh, let me ask or let me hand over the stage and the mic to Dr. Nana Blue. Thank you so much, Dr. Blue. Thank you so much. And uh, it's an honor to be here today talking with all of you. I have admired Cell from afar for a while and I'm really happy to be here talking with y'all today. So, uh, I will just jump in and reiterate that I'm, I'm very grateful to be speaking to you from the territories of Chinook and Kalapuya speaking peoples here in the beautiful intersection of the Willamette and Columbia River Valleys in Portland, Oregon. And I would also like to uh, dedicate this talk to the memory of Dr. Tucker Childs at Portland State University, whose work with sociolinguistic documentation has been foundational to both my own research and sort of the entire discipline of sociolinguistic documentation. So uh, since I am speaking to the Society for Endangered Languages India, I'm sure this is familiar to all of you, but global language endangerment is currently at a scope and pace that is unknown previously in human history uh, to the best of our knowledge and nearly half of the world's total languages are currently at risk of being extinguished. Uh, and this is a, a global problem. There is not a single place on earth where this is not happening. But the real question for people who study language endangerment is why? Uh, 
Uh, and the follow-up question is, of course, what do we do about it? Uh, and I do really prefer this, this term being forced into hibernation rather than dying or falling silent, which sort of implies that this is a natural process that will just happen regardless of uh, what we do about it. Uh, there's a couple of references that explore terminology a little further in the references. But I will say that this question of why is one that we've sort of known the answer to at least since the early 20th century. So Morris Swadesh back in 1948 already wrote that the factors determining obsolescence of language are non-linguistic, right? We've always known that this is fundamentally a social, political, historical problem, not a linguistic problem. Uh, and obviously language shift always happens as a result of issues affecting the human beings and communities who use languages, right? It's never due to the nature of the language itself. There's no such thing as a language that is too complicated to continue being used. Uh, and today in most places, language shift is almost never a result of free and uncoerced choice by the language community in question. And so when it comes to what people do in response to this reality, uh, the range of activities include advocacy, activism, and policy, right? Any types of efforts to restore language or stop language shift through political or organizational means. Uh, language revitalization, which is currently one of my focus areas, but not what we're talking about today exactly. And really today we're gonna be talking about language documentation. Um, in, the, in the classical definition, creating lasting or multi-purpose records of what, we'll come back to that. Uh, but language documentation, revitalization, and advocacy are complementary activities without hard boundaries between them, right? Language documentation can be used for the purposes of advocacy, revitalization, and so forth. Uh, but in the early years, the foundational years of language documentation, the two big focuses really were for research, for linguistic theory, and for the vague concept of posterity, for people to have these records in the future for some reason. So mo for most of the 20th century and even prior to that, language description and language documentation were essentially the same thing, right? Um, the focus was on linguistic analysis of the structure of a language, more so than the data itself that produced that analysis. Uh, and the traditional products were what, what's called the Boazian trilogy, right? Generally, when you see a documentation project, it will still probably center around a dictionary, a grammar, and some texts of some kind, even if text today means multimedia materials. Uh, and traditionally, the focus was on the lexico-grammatical code, right, the structure of a specific bounded language, uh, much more so than the social context of language, language in practice, and so on. Although I will, I would like to hear from y'all, this is a North America focus from my own training. In India and elsewhere, early language documentation may have had more of a focus on survey work, so I, I hope you'll enlighten me in the comments and questions time. Uh, so things started to change a little bit, at least in North American language documentation in the early 1990s, when the discipline of linguistics started taking language endangerment seriously again. Uh, and in the late 90s, the thing we currently call language documentation was theorized by Himmelman as a lasting multi-purpose record of the linguistic practices characteristic of a speech community. Uh, and he also described it as radically expanded text collection, right? Which of course refers to more concrete examples of language in use rather than disembodied in the form of a dictionary or a grammar with example sentences. And he, he differentiated language description and documentation uh, with a description aiming at the record of a language with language as a system of abstract elements whereas language documentation aims at the record of the linguistic practices and traditions of a speech community. And this is an important distinction that gave birth to the entire field of sociolinguistic documentation, but uh, wasn't necessarily observed uh, through the early years of language documentation. And in addition, one thing that sets classically theorized documentation apart 
is that it is concerned with the compilation of primary data and interfaces between primary data and various types of analyses, right? So it's not just a focus on collecting mass amounts of language information without analysis. It's not a focus on analysis itself, but it's really a focus on the interface, right? How data and analysis feed into each other. But again, in classical documentation, right? And as a relatively young scholar, classical documentation to me means like 1992 through 2012. Uh, the primary data that documentary projects have focused on generally still include structural concerns. So lexicon, phonology, grammar, and some texts, but limited types of texts, almost always just traditional stories or narratives, often monologues instead of conversational data. And the target of the, the most documentation projects have been what Anthony Woodbury called the ancestral code, right? This imaginary variety of a language which is pure and long standing over many generations. Uh, it's imagined as having a one to one relationship with a specific community or ethnic group, right? Like this is the language of this tribe. That's rarely the case. Uh, the documentation project should focus on language used by the ideal native speaker who's often imagined to be a monolingual. Those people don't often exist. And those documentation projects often then focus on language used by uh, what sociolinguists call norms, the non-mobile older rural males, right? To get the perfect, most authentic version of the language being documented. And so generally, hypothetically, uh, a classical documentation project might privilege the speech of a monolingual Kui speaking elder over a younger person who has multiple languages in their repertoire and sometimes mixes them together, right? But if language documentation is in fact supposed to create a record of the real linguistic practices of a speech community, this traditional narrow focus on grammatical description isn't really achieving those aims. And perhaps more importantly to me, if the causes of language loss are non-linguistic, right? If those causes are social, political, historical, why would documentary linguists focus on structural description exclusively instead of the interfaces between social realities that cause language endangerment and language use itself? Uh, and even back in 2013, Susan Penfield was noting that to document or revitalize a language without a nod to the forces that brought it there is an incomplete study. And so newer practices in language documentation really are moving towards focusing on the holistic reality of linguistic practices, broadly speaking, of a given speech community. Uh, and speech community in the sociolinguistic sense, uh, not quite the same as a physical community, but really we're talking about a group of people who have shared language practices. And so if we remember that language documentation is about interfaces, uh, we're really talking about the interfaces between more things like land and ecology and language, cognition and language, political context and language, and importantly for me, social context and language. Those interfaces are a really rich area of inquiry. But many linguists, even today, especially people who fund documentation projects or award tenure or review, are still focused on the documentation of a specific language as the default model of a documentation project. And if you're working in Africa and probably also in India, uh, it's really difficult to pinpoint a specific language to focus on, right? In contexts where everyone is very multilingual and there's a lot of fluidity in language use, it's very tough to pick a language that you're supposed to be focusing on. Uh, and especially in African contexts, the language of a given speech community is nearly impossible to pinpoint, right? Uh, DiCarlo et al. noted, there's been a tendency on the part of outside linguists to view African rural spaces in terms of tribes, each associated with its own language, which leads to erasure of multilingual behavior. And again, if we're supposed to be documenting linguistic practices, 
we're getting an incomplete picture at best. So most people's everyday language use involves many languages, right? At least two, most people probably in the world are at least bilingual. And within bounded languages, they're probably using many varieties and registers. And so if we're going to document linguistic practice, we should be looking at things like variation, language change, language attitudes, conversation structure, multilingual patterns, translanguaging or code switching, and everything else, all of the wonderful creative things people do with language. And so in 2014, there was this seminal paper, Beyond the Ancestral Code. Uh, this was sort of the first theorization of sociolinguistic language documentation. Uh, and it was developed at a workshop at the 2012 uh, World Congress of African Linguistics. Uh, this is a, I, I just like to show this clip to show that linguistic research can be fun. <laughs> Right. Uh, all conferences should be that fun. But this paper developed at this workshop made some really important points about not only African language contexts, but multilingual contexts all over the world. Uh, and they note approaches privileging one language as ancestral are problematic and potentially even pernicious in highly multilingual contexts. Language documentation's emphasis on capturing the world's linguistic diversity will fall short of its potential if issues like these are not seriously considered. And some of these concrete examples of places where sociolinguistic documentation is mandatory, right, where documentation will make no sense without a strong sociolinguistic focus, include, uh, close to my heart, the Lower Fungom region of Northwest Cameroon. Uh, this is not where I work. This is somewhat far from the part of Cameroon where I work. But Lower Fungom is a cluster of 13 villages with only about 12,000 people there. Uh, it's about the size of the city of Chicago. And there are eight languages spoken only in Lower Fungom. Uh, most people there are extremely multilingual. So the average person speaks three to 10 local languages plus Cameroonian Pidgin English, which is a language of wider communication. And multilingualism there doesn't even really fit classical sociolinguistic models of multilingual behavior, right? Diglossia or polyglossia don't really apply. There's no clear prestige hierarchy. There's no clear delimitation of domains for each language. Instead, it's entirely context dependent on the specific interaction that's happening and the people talking to each other, right? So one person who knows languages A, B, and C will meet someone who they know is from the language B speaking town, and they will use the shared language that they know they have an affiliation with to demonstrate solidarity or friendship or tease them. But if then if they want to create distance, if they get angry at that person or they want to scold them, they'll switch to a language that is not uh, one that's shared between them in affiliations, right? So it's really complicated stuff that couldn't be fruitfully understood without a lot of really deep sociolinguistic inquiry. And so if we were to set out to do a classical documentation project of a single language, what could possibly be the target of documentation in this small place with at least eight languages? Even if we were working in just one village, which language would someone pick to document? Uh, would it be the language that's exclusively spoken in that village? Uh, but then we would be ignoring contact effects from the other languages and the historical descent and how that language came to be. We'd be ignoring borrowings. And even if we picked just one person to work with, we still wouldn't really be able to choose which language to document, right? Uh, if even if someone wanted to document that person's native language, that concept doesn't even necessarily apply in the lower Fungom context, right? So this is a place where sociolinguistic documentation is a must if we are to make sense of what's happening. Another example uh, would be Mission La Paz in Bolivia. This is a village about 650 people where there are three indigenous languages plus Spanish spoken. Uh, and people in Mission La Paz practice linguistic exogamy, which means everybody must marry someone who speaks a different language, right? So every family has two parents who speak two different languages. So children grow up with their two parent languages, 
they speak both, they use both. And then when a child grows up, they pick one language and only speak that one from there on out. They still understand all the others, but they only use one, they only produce one. Uh, and as far as what motivates this choice, it's not the traditional sort of first wave sociolinguistic stuff of gender or geography or clan. It really just seems to be personal preference, um, which language the person likes most. And so this results in what you might call passive multilingualism or dual lingualism. Everybody speaks the, uh, the language that they themselves have chosen, but they understand everyone else's languages. And again, if we were to do a single language documentation project in Mission La Paz, what language would it be? Even if you're working in just one household, you couldn't really pick a single language. Same thing if you were working with just one person. Even if you picked the language that they chose to use, you'd be ignoring contact effects, borrowing everything else about their multilingual repertoire that affects how they speak. So I think that we've shown that sociolinguistic documentation is necessary to make sense of documentation data in a lot of contexts, right? Just to do a good job at our self-professed goals for language documentation, we need sociolinguistic documentation. And so the why answer for the field of linguistics is it lets us gather better data. It lets us make better language descriptions. Uh, and so it lets us look into contact effects, historical ties between languages, lexical choices, structural choices, right? Lots of capital L linguistics things. And it also opens doors for new areas of theory, right? Especially within sociolinguistics. Uh, so if we look at actual language and in use, including things like variation, that allows us to do variationist inquiry in a wider variety of languages. Uh, so for example, there's the Stanford and Preston volume, uh, variation in indigenous and minority languages. And without sociolinguistic documentation, we wouldn't have the foundation to expand variation as sociolinguistics. But beyond sort of the linguistic analysis questions, really the one I'm concerned about in my own work is whether documentation is optimally useful for language maintenance and revitalization, right? We do language documentation for many reasons, including linguistic theory and posterity. But for me, the important one is creating records that can be used by the speech community for whatever their language goals are, including language revitalization. Similarly, for language maintenance, if language policy, educational resources, and so on are being developed, they should reflect actual sociolinguistic reality. And sociolinguistic documentation helps create a more accurate picture of language use so that you can develop good policy, educational resources, and so on. And again, if language revitalization is going to be an option in the future, if we're creating documentation for the purposes of revitalization, shouldn't reclamation of all real linguistic practices be an option, right? People don't want to just reclaim words or sounds or grammar. They want to reclaim actual language behavior. And so being able to revitalize traditional multilingual practices or metalinguistic knowledge or ver patterns of variation that were socially meaningful is really important. Uh, and I really love this quote from Heather Souter, who is a Michif language activist, along with other Métis languages. Uh, so she said that my people have traditionally been multilingual. Some may say that our core language is Michif, but I work on language revitalization of all, all our languages. And she says, I wish multilingualism or polylingualism was considered important at a time when there were more polylingual elders in gathering in my community. I'm sad I never asked aunties if I could audio or video record them, right? So people in the future will actually be expressing a wish that we had done the sociolinguistic documentation because it permits revitalization of really important language practices like multilingualism. And beyond these points, I also want to add that any 
actually participatory, collaborative, ethical research needs to be based in community goals, understandings, and ideologies about language, right? So without having a shared understanding of sociolinguistic reality in a community, without actually understanding how language functions in the social world, not just the lexicogrammatical world, we are going to be bringing in assumptions about what we research, what we do with that knowledge, and what products we make. Uh, we're going to be bringing in assumptions about how language works, and those assumptions might be inaccurate at best, or they might actually be harmful. They might hinder efforts to revitalize language practices. And so, okay, let's hope we're all on the same page now that sociolinguistic documentation is good and necessary. So how do we do it? What does it include? Uh, I think all of us are familiar with the classic model of documentation. We know we need to write a dictionary, a grammar, and collect some texts. But what would a sociolinguistic documentation look like? Uh, so in the Child's Good and Mitchell paper, they suggest collecting linguistic data in a carefully considered range of contexts, right? Moving beyond just traditional monologues, stories, instructionals, songs. Uh, so including things like gatherings, conversations, uh, people talking to their kids, that sort of thing. Uh, also, better metadata, right? Ensuring that data is associated with a rich representation of the sociolinguistic configuration of the event, right? Who's there? What are their relationships to each other? What languages do they know? What are they trying to do socially in that interaction? Uh, and also collecting ancillary resources like surveys, metalinguistic interviews, and ethnographic sketches that let us situate our data in the actual context of the language community. And this last one is perhaps my main interest in research. Uh, we might call it radically expanded metalinguistic interviews. Uh, really, I'm talking about what uh, anthropologists might call thick description of people's self-described language practices, what they say about their own language knowledge and experiences and attitudes. Uh, really, I'm interested in people's subjective experiences of language. So, how do we do all this? This is rather daunting. Uh, one path uh, is, is what I set out to do. For my dissertation, I wanted to try something that I didn't really have any models for. I wanted to do a sociolinguistic documentation in the sense that other PhD students might create a grammar text and dictionary. Um, and so I wanted to focus on a specific set of linguistic practices since my interest was in language endangerment and language revitalization. I wanted to do sociolinguistic documentation of language shift and maintenance uh, in IASA, which is a language with two or 3,000 speakers at most in southern Cameroon. Uh, it's also spoken in Equatorial Guinea, but that border crossing is difficult, so I couldn't go there. I could just look across the river at Equatorial Guinea. Uh, so again, sociolinguistic documentation included getting some sense of the linguistic ecology of the places where IASA is spoken. This was a huge research question. So there are four languages considered indigenous to the area. Uh, there's IASA and then three not very closely related languages. Uh, and then there are also a lot of languages which have arrived more recently. So colonial languages like French, which is the target of language shift in IASA communities, and then a lot of languages of newcomers to the area from largely more socioeconomically powerful groups. So some of my questions included what languages are part of the repertoires of people who also speak IASA? Uh, and what relationships exist between this broader social context and language shift and maintenance? And perhaps most interestingly to me, how do IASA speakers themselves perceive and discuss and feel about language shift and maintenance? I'm always interested in what people have to say in their own words. Uh, and since I was also trained in quantitative variationist work, I also wanted to see if there were experimental sociolinguistic methods that could be used to investigate language shift here. And most importantly, how could this type of sociolinguistic documentation support efforts to maintain or revitalize the language? 
So really how to research these questions was a big blank slate. There are not a lot of templates for sociolinguistic documentation. There are some good small studies that approach them. And my goal was to bring together sort of bits and pieces of what other folks had done into a more comprehensive sociolinguistic documentation. Uh, it's challenging to work <laughs> without a very clear path or clear examples. Um, there's no template to follow, like I mentioned, and sociolinguistic documentation as compared to lexico grammatical documentation can be really, really challenging and especially so for outside researchers who don't have an existing deep familiarity with that social context. So really the best tool in my toolbox, especially at the beginning, was interviews, lots and lots and lots of talking to people. Uh, so for my dissertation work, I talked to 70 people in five towns and villages. These interviews were 30 to 90 minutes. There were a few really long ones that were great, um, but these were done in French. And often I would interview folks alongside a Cameroonian research colleague or two. Uh, and this was just sort of an open-ended discussion of each person's biography, where they grew up, uh, what they had done for work, their linguistic repertoires, where they had learned these languages, when they liked to use each language, their attitudes, and then really a lot of talking about their perception and experience of language loss and language shift in IASA. Uh, so this is me and Sharma Molongwa, who was extremely patient with all of my silly questions. And another approach I wanted to try was experimental work. Um, so I wanted to investigate something people brought up during the interviews, which was, I'm sure many of you have heard this in language communities you work with, old people saying that the young people talk wrong, right? This is ubiquitous in every language context. There are always complaints about young people talking wrong, but I was curious whether the things old people identified as mistakes were actually correlated with language shift, right? They would say, oh, young people say this thing wrong because they don't really know IASA. And so I wanted to see if these mistakes actually correlated with reduced language proficiency. So I did some structured elicitation uh, through uh, narration of a silent video and also some picture naming tasks. And then I did translation tasks which with each of those people. Uh, to this was a very rough attempt to gauge proficiency in IASA, right? just to see if they were able to understand and translate IASA sentences into French and vice versa. And again, the goal was to see if these mistakes identified by old folks actually did relate to reduced ability to understand and speak IASA. But perhaps the most important tool aside from interviews was just hanging out. Uh, and if we want to call it something fancy, Childs, Good, and Mitchell say that effective documentation requires adoption of various ethnographic methods for research and applied purposes. As most of us know, a key ethnographic method is just hanging around with people. Uh, and the applied purposes include being a nice person and building good relationships in the community, right? So that was probably my most important research method was just hanging out with people. So these were all very preliminary attempts to conduct sociolinguistic documentation and see what worked and what didn't. Uh, and it was challenging in many ways, but it did produce some useful findings. So perhaps most interestingly to me was better understanding of all of the complexities and tensions and patterns in this small but heterogeneous community about how people see and experience language and language shift, right? So this was a good reminder that no community is a monolith. Everyone has their own very different individual experiences of language. Uh, and these sociolinguistic interview type approaches can be useful for exploring questions that anthropologists may have done through more traditional ethnographic methods. 
Uh, and the experimental project did produce a potentially viable model for looking at variation and proficiency in language shift. Um, spoiler alert, the results were that these mistakes did not actually correlate with reduced proficiency in IASA. In fact, even older people who spoke by all accounts very good IASA made these mistakes. So really these mistakes look just like innovative features, new features, um, but this reminds us that purism and authenticity and shame about good or real language are very important to take into account when we're doing documentation and revitalization. Uh, there's also a lot of opportunities for side documentation, right? So just sort of opportunistic recording of, of classical texts. So when you're doing an interview with somebody and they say, oh, yeah, it was fun to talk to you. By the way, can you please record my favorite song? That's a very nice opportunity. Uh, and having more sociolinguistic information will make these materials more legible, more understandable to outsiders and people in the future understanding the social context of these materials. But perhaps the most important thing that came out of this sociolinguistic documentation work for me was useful, workable knowledge for language revitalization. So through interviews, through these studies, we found that youth really are the tipping point of language shift in this community, by which I mean, People sort of in their 40s and older have good proficiency in IASA mostly. Kids younger than teens generally do not have much ability in IASA. And youth, sort of people in their teens through their 30s, are really where it's variable. Some of them know a lot of IASA, some of them understand but don't speak much. And so this group was really where we wanted to focus for language revitalization. Uh, and doing all of these interviews and doing this sociolinguistic documentation work gave us some insight into what might work in language revitalization and what people wanted and needed, right? How to do learner-centered revitalization instead of just sort of taking ideas from the outside and seeing if they would apply here. Uh, so what people really wanted, uh, especially youth, to reconnect with their language was spaces for judgment-free learning, right? No, no elders around saying you're talking wrong, you're doing it wrong. Uh, people really wanted to learn to read and write in IASA. They were excited to learn how to type and create digital materials in IASA. And maybe most importantly, young people wanted language work to be fun and accessible and playful, right? They didn't want it to be scary or full of shame. They wanted a safe, fun space to reconnect with language. And so uh, with these findings, my colleague Sammy Mbipite and I, uh, who is below me in this picture, uh, we started uh, an IASA youth organization for revitalization called IASA EBO, which means IASA Forward. And of all of the work that I did during my dissertation period, this is probably the most important, the most meaningful. Uh, this group doubled in size since 2018 when we started it, and they are still meeting. They are still holding youth language club meetings, which is incredible. And so after all this, sometimes there are students in the audience. I'm not sure if all of you are already sociolinguistic documentation practitioners, but sometimes people want suggestions for doing this type of work. So I guess my primary suggestion is to really focus on your relationships with the people you're working with. Um, that is both your primary responsibility as a researcher, especially if you are coming in from the outside, but it's also your primary asset, right? Doing sociolinguistic documentation is about understanding people and what they do and what they think, and relationships are really key to that. So you have a kuleana, uh, which is Hawaiian for both a responsibility and a privilege and a right to the people and languages you work with, right? You have responsibilities and the privilege of working with people and languages. Um, you will definitely hit dead ends in gathering or analyzing data or doing anything useful with it because again, there aren't very many clear cut templates for this kind of work and not very many examples to follow. Also, 
social lives of humans are complicated and you will run into a thousand dead ends when you're trying to understand it. Uh, this can also be very delicate work because you're talking about people's interior lives. You're talking about their experiences. And in contexts of language endangerment, you're talking about stuff that is probably tied in with trauma and painful history and ongoing social struggle. Uh, and so you will almost certainly make mistakes that offend or hurt people or embarrass yourself. It will probably happen many times. This is tough work. And again, because we're doing work about experiences around human struggle, uh, you're gonna find this work exhausting and heartbreaking and confusing and perhaps even dangerous, depending on the context you're in, and challenging. But I think we should all do it anyway, right? Even those of us who aren't sociolinguists by orientation, try to work in the basics of sociolinguistic documentation in your work. Uh, it's profoundly useful, it's interesting, and it's meaningful. It is helpful to the goals of the community you're working with. And so when we do our best to do this type of holistic and ethical and human focused language documentation, right? When our underlying understanding is that language and the people who use it cannot be separated, then we have the real joy and privilege and honor of forming real relationships with people and languages. Okay, but thank you. Uh, and I'm, I'm excited to take your questions and thoughts. Um, thank you so much, uh, Dr. Blue. I have lots of questions myself, myself, but I would like to open the platform for uh, questions from our audience first. Uh, so if anyone has any questions, you are welcome to, you know, like unmute yourself and ask your question right away. Okay, just let me go ahead first while you are, while everybody else is. Oh, okay, Karthik, do you wanna, do you wanna ask something? No, you please go ahead since you started. No, you go ahead. <laughs> <laughs> now, now, pehle aap. You know I'm from London. Ah, yeah, yeah, fine, that's pehle okay. Aap. All uh, right. So, Anna, it's an interesting work. I've also read parts of it before. So, before I start off, um, so this work on social linguistic documentation that we talk of, uh, I also do something very similar to what you said and then, uh, uh, what I notice often is that uh, that there is, seems to be a uh, more focus on language use per se in our con in these works and contexts, and people tend to lose the focus on structures at sometimes. Like I'm just it's a self criticism, not just necessarily a criticism pointed towards you. Okay, now uh, uh, one of the things that I didn't do in my study and that you did is the language attrition experiment. Okay, sort of a thing. So could you talk to us more about the tasks that you did? You just mentioned picture naming task and uh, translation. Could you just talk a bit about those and uh, tell us a bit more on the results that you got? Because you said there are not a lot of changes uh, between the uh, data from the adults and the youngsters. So could you talk a bit about it? And also tell when the language is not changing, how it is shifting. Because at the, at the very end, you hinted that the language the answers are shift on the tip of shifting towards shifting away probably from the language. So can you uh, just make those bridges there? Yeah, hi Karthik, good to see you. And yes, thank you for that question. I, I did have to speed through this. So thanks for offering me the opportunity to detail it a little more. Uh, so these tasks essentially were to look at uh, three lexical variations identified by old folks. Uh, and they're what I sort of called the, the double plural or the novel plural. Uh, so in most Bantu languages, there are noun class markers that are paired, right? So there's singular class seven and then it's plural correspondent. And people were complaining that there are some lexical items that take a null plural, right? That do not traditionally have the, the traditional plural marker but younger folks allegedly were putting the plural marker to create, I guess, the English equivalent of like forkses or motorcycleses, right? And it made old people really mad. They were really annoyed by it. 
Um, and so I wanted to see if this sort of double plural or novel plural was actually related to reduced language proficiency, if it was a mistake born of not knowing the language very well, or if it was just sort of a normal change in progress, just a normal innovation. Uh, and so I prepared a, I actually filmed this little uh, stimulus video with two of the folks I worked with, one of whom has now passed. Um, and it was a video about two motorcycle drivers who go and they use forks and, you know, they, they do the things that the lexical items are included in. Uh, and I had people narrate that video. It was a silent video. So I had them tell me what was happening in that video to see if they would say motorcycles is or forks is or whatever. Uh, and then I also did a picture naming task with a bunch of uh, distractor items like elephants and palm trees, but also motorcycles and forks. And the other lexical item was mornings, but I don't know if any of y'all have ever tried to elicit the word morning using visual stimuli. It's very hard. Nobody, they were like, oh, it's a sunrise. It's a rooster. I don't know. It's a clock, right? It's hard to get that with a picture. So really the focus was on the motorcycles and the forks. Uh, and so with each person who did these uh, tasks, I also did the translation task to see and I coded this for the specific lexical items that they translated correctly or incorrectly. Uh, I did it with Sammy Mbipite's help. He's a native speaker linguist. And so we just assigned point values to each element of the sentence to see if they translated, like, you know, if, if they could basically convey the meaning of the sentence. Like, did you get the fact that someone is lying? Did you get the fact that there's a healer? Did you get the fact that there's anger, right? Just the basic core meanings of the sentence. And so um, we then, I, I then, I'm bad at stats. It's been two years since I did stats. I did a statistical analysis of the, the relationship between uh, the novel plural and the score on the translation task. And the result really was that, A, there is a slight correlation between age and use of the novel plural. Young people are a bit more likely to use it but it was totally unrelated to proficiency in IASA and older folks also used the novel plural. So really it looks more like what sociolinguists would identify as a change in progress, not a symptom of shift. So for those of us interested in variation and language shift, it was a good reminder that A, you can't just take at face value every complaint people have about language and B, sometimes normal, change happens in languages that are undergoing shift and it's not necessarily a symptom of shift. I hope that answered the question. Oh yes, it does. So, sorry, I'm just extending Madri. So this uh, uh, results on variation is uh, could be compared with the chapter uh, from the Cambridge handbook, Austin and uh, Julia Selabank's uh, handbook, uh, which talks about changes in language, uh, endangered languages. Uh, variation in endangered languages, where they talk about uh, variations not being correlatable or there are no correlatable uh, social, let's say, social uh, features like age or gender, and then that's being more commonly spread across the community. So I just, that's the thing that I have to ask, but it's an interesting thing. And I'm very, and I'm glad that you are using the local stimuli. I will try it out and I'll let you know how it works for me. Yeah, it's really fun to create stimuli with the folks you're working with too. It's it's a good way to build relationships. Like that day filming that video really like deepened my friendship with those two guys. <laughs> yes, I'll, I'll report back to you on how it went for me. Yeah. Thank you. Uh, okay, thank you very much, Karthik, for your question. And I'm sure it cleared a number of things for a number of people here uh, today. Uh, we have another, a few more actually, there are a few comments as well. Uh, it was a wonderful presentation, obviously, and uh, we have a question from Dr. Hasebuddin. Dr. Hasebuddin asks, what's the ethical benefit of language documentation? Would you like to uh, elaborate on that question, Dr. Hasebuddin, if you are here? Or um, uh, is, is it clear enough for uh, Dr. Blue, if you want to just like go ahead with it? Because I, I'm, uh, I'm not sure if I understand it, but I'm sure uh, you will be able to speak a little bit. Dr. Hasebuddin, are you here? I don't think they are here, but um, okay, oh yeah, you are. Uh, yes. Would you sure. like to ask your question and elaborate on it on it a little bit so that uh, Dr. Blue is more clear about what you're asking? 
Ma'am, you are elaborating regarding this uh, social linguistic documentation, uh, and you touched uh, the ethical part in Sri That I wanted to know what's that ethical sense uh, that this social linguistic documentation. Uh, so I want elaboration in that aspect of it. Yeah, thank you. Um, that's a very big question, so I'll try and answer it concisely. Um, with with the I guess with the context that I can only speak for myself and my own training and my own perspective in language documentation. Um, the main reason that I want to do this work is to be useful to other people, right? Especially the people whose languages are undergoing shift. And so the driving question in most of my language documentation work is how can I be useful to the people I'm working with? And so uh, in this case, the experience of people requesting things for their language, right? Wanting literacy programs, wanting revitalization programs. I figured out that to be useful in developing those things, it was necessary to have a good, A, sociolinguistic understanding of the language context, and B, to have good documentation of the structure of the language, like Kartik mentioned. Um, so I did not create sort of the lexico-grammatical documentation, but I knew that my training would let me help with the sociolinguistic documentation. And so the ethical benefit of doing this is for me that it enhances our ability to contribute to language communities' goals, right? If people want a revitalization program, good documentation, both traditional lexico-grammatical documentation and sociolinguistic documentation will contribute to that goal and make it more likely to be successful and viable and sustainable. Um, and I think documentation in general, I always come back to something that uh, Darren McKinney at Miramar said. Um, he, he described language documentation as a safety net, right? In the event that, you know, God forbid, all of the speakers of a language pass, there's a lot of psychological comfort in having solid documentation to fall back on, to know that people in the future, your descendants will be able to go back and reclaim that language with good documentation, even if there aren't people living to learn from anymore. Uh, so I guess those are, those are two of the, the points that I think of when it comes to the ethical benefits of documentation of all kinds. Uh, but there are many, many more answers to that, depending on your perspective and work. Uh, thank you so thank much. You, you. I, I, I imagine that the question would be big and uh, it is in fact a very deep one. Uh, so thank you very much for uh, treating um, uh, as in, you know, answering in, in what you're as in, you know, delving deep into your own experiences. Thank you very much. We also have one from Monali and we have one from Krishna who says, thanks a lot. I once was a student of Dr. Childs. I'm guessing that's the, uh, that's your teacher who you to pay this, you, who, are your, you, who you are attributing this lecture to. So thank you very much. Uh, it's, it's, um, uh, Monali's question is, uh, it was a wonderful presentation uh, and you were right in understanding most of the other documentations uh, most of the older Indian documentations as survey works on those languages. Yes, that is actually something which I also wanted to say. You're, that is uh, that was uh, the older documentation processes when we when we talk about that. Krishna also says, I think language documentation should be problem solving. Uh, it can be a good model of language documentation, but its scope is broad and vague in several contexts because sociolinguistic situation varies from place to place or community to community. How do we deal with it? Mm. <laughs> Extremely true, yeah. The kinds of variation we see in sociolinguistic context is, it would, it would scare typologists, right? If you're looking at grammatical typology, there's only a, a strict parameter of options probably, but sociolinguistic context, the variation seems infinite, just like human behavior seems infinite. Uh, so that vagueness is just something you have to get comfortable with if you're doing sociolinguistic documentation. You have to go in expecting that your prior knowledge is insufficient and that you're going to have to learn a lot really, really fast and catch up rapidly. Um, really, I think flexibility is the name of the game when you're doing sociolinguistic documentation, um, going in with humility, knowing that you're starting from zero. Uh, and a lot of deep curiosity and a lot of listening. Um, I think sociolinguistic documentation is in many ways a first step 
for other things. Uh, so I think seeing it as like a foundation, seeing it as a beginning uh, helps you deal with the vagueness and uncertainty of what you're going to find. Um, yeah, so, so it, for that reason, it's hard to develop like a, a strict template or a best practice set for sociolinguistic documentation because it is so different in every context. So I think the best practice is itself flexibility, curiosity, and leaving behind as many assumptions as you can and just seeing what's happening. It's, it's not a very satisfying answer for like a student or somebody who likes to follow a set set of steps, but it is what it is. Or some or somebody who has uh, you know a funding from a particular place and they want to give deliverables and they and whoever they, the, <laughs> the funding agency they want the learning outcomes or the outcomes of the project as soon as like written down so you don't really know what exactly you are going to uh, go for uh, that brings us to my question which I had the 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 people that the the community that we are working with currently that uh, my head of the department has been working with for the past two decades actually more than two decades. Um, we have found that they don't really have, uh, even if they had at one point of time, due to the extreme socio sociological uh, hardship that they have had to face over the years, uh, they kind of don't have um, folk songs or folk narratives or uh, or if they had and they have lost it so far. However, we have been working with the community and like you said, the youth is is the main uh, is is one of the most important. Um, uh, you know, people who want to be connected or who want to be associated with the pro with projects like this. We have been able to um, inspire the youth to work with us, with us for the past, uh, like, you know, probably five to 10 years. And some of the students have come out. And like you said, you have uh, a language club where they meet you, the, Ilyas, the Yasa people, they have a language club and then they meet and the size has grown. We also have uh, had good results in the past few years. However, the, my dilemma comes from the fact that you want to create certain things with the community because, because they don't have songs and because we have found that students or kids of a certain age, they respond the best to music and they respond to best, respond best to, um, you know, um, stimuli which is presented, presented to them in, in form of music. The community members, some of these students who are working with us in the club, they have worked with us to develop songs uh, in different, uh, with different linguistic elements in mind. For example, we have a number song. Then we have a song which talks about morning, noon, and night. Then we have a breakfast song or time song which talks about uh, what you what you are eating at breakfast or what you're eating at lunch and what you are eating at dinner and things like that. All of these uh, songs have been created by the community themselves. But my question is, my dilemma is, is it, uh, is it correct? Uh, or is it right on my part as a linguist to uh, document these items uh, or you know to preserve these items and call it documentation because i'm not really documenting something which is uh, which is or which was originally a part of uh, their um, culture or their yeah even though the items which are which, this, which even though the songs or the items which uh, are reflected in these songs or poems etc are all authentic items but they're not really created by the community as such. It was created by a group of people which was brought together for this very specific purpose of documenting the language. So where do I come in? Where, where does that kind of work come in? I'm sorry, this was a very long winding thingy, but yeah. Yeah, no, no worries. There's, it's hard to talk about this stuff briefly because it's so complex. Um, yeah, that's a great question. And it really gets back to this notion of authenticity that kind of runs through all of this work. And this, the ancestral code is an obsession with authenticity and authentic language and how we conceive of what's real or authentic or traditional can be very restrictive. And so in this case, the guiding question, maybe if we're considering ourselves documentary linguists, is this a linguistic practice of the community? And the answer is yes, right? People are using the songs, kids are singing the songs. Uh, really what I would say is, I mean, I lean on the side of document everything and because that context is gonna shape our understanding of what we record. So documenting not only the songs, but how they came to be would be 
I think the real documentary linguist perspective on this, all of the context you can wrap in, not only the language use itself, but the historical context of it, the social context of it, who was involved in developing these songs, what is their language background, what do they believe about language, and then the people who sing the songs now, what do they think about them, how do they feel about the quote unquote authenticity of the songs. Um, really it's it's coming at it not from a place of judgment or determining what's worthy of documentation, but a place of curiosity and trying to share and record as much knowledge as possible um, to, to keep for the future or for whatever purpose. So in this case, yeah, record those songs. That's great. Record who made them and why and what people think about them and just get all of it. Yes, absolutely. That makes takes like so takes so many things off my off of my <laughs> mind thank you so much but i have another um uh, just a clarification okay i like because it's like something i want to hear you say it so that i know that i am doing it right like somebody else is also out of this uh like in the same context things that okay this is fine okay the kids uh we have had very good results with the same group of kids that that i was talking about because initially when we started we started with literally three people who knew these songs and uh who who were who were involved in the making of these songs because that person that one person who is our main resource person as far as the language is concerned um she had was tapped previously by different government organizations to you know represent her community at uh government functions etc because that's how things work here and uh, she uh, we got in touch with her and she was very interested in this and we all of us together our team and her and some of the people that she knew in the community we came together and created these um uh, these songs the language is completely theirs the language and the just the idea that we can create a number song like this one two three four five six because they have different names for the numbers um in their own language anyway so uh, when it, it started with her and just two more people uh, and now we have classes in in two or three ha in in the different ham hamlets in, in, in which the community resides so the people are uh, some of the kids are singing those the song without realizing that it was something which was specifically created for them so if i so when i document it this is also something worthy of mentioning right I mean, I think so, yeah. Okay. I mean, on one hand, kids don't have a lot of metalinguistic thoughts, I don't think, right? <laughs> kids aren't wondering about the authenticity of the number song they're learning. They're just like, oh, cool, a number song. Yeah, it's a number uh, song, and let's learn it. And it's like something that you can do <laughs> while you are hopping on that hopscotch, the game that you were that that you play. So that's what gives it the rhythm and everything. Anyway, so okay, I'm just happy that no, I'm probably <laughs> we are going in the right track. Thank you very much. Yeah. And uh, if nobody has any other question, uh, oh, because I got a question in a direct message, actually. Oh, yeah, um, sure. Please. So, yeah, Nasira asked, how did you merge your qualitative and ethnographic and quantitative analysis? Didn't the results vary based on the methods you used? Uh, that's a great question. And yes, of course, the results were very different based on, you know, which how we were looking at it. Uh, language behavior always looks a little different depending on the angle you're looking at it from. And so I guess, how did I merge them? How did I integrate them? As we were saying that the focus of documentation is the interface between data and analysis, really, I think the interesting stuff comes out at the interfaces between different methods, right? When you start comparing what you get in interviews to what you actually observe happening uh, at the marketplace versus you know, what experimental methods turn up, when you investigate the places that those things align and also the places where they diverge, that's where the insight really comes in, I think. So the, the way that interview data about you know, young people talking wrong actually diverged from experimental data about language proficiency, that divergence is kind of where the interesting knowledge happens for me. And so rather than being troubled that I got different results based on the method, I think that's actually a good thing. I think that's an interesting, fruitful thing. Um, those discrepancies and also those overlaps are where you can learn a lot. I hope that made sense. It's kind of an abstract answer. 
Uh, yeah, Nasira, if, if I didn't answer your question, please let me know. Um, yes, you did, but uh, I think I could only solve this once I have gotten all the data and start analyzing by myself. <laughs> so I just wanted to know your opinion, what you did with the data. No? Thank you so much. Yeah, and if you have like specific questions about what you're working on, I'd love to chat. I'd love to hear about your work. So email me if you'd like to. Yeah, sure, sure. Thank you so much. Thank you very much, Nasira, for your question. Uh, do we have anything else? Anyone else who would want to? Um, Karthik, thanks you, obviously. And thanks, the thanks, Cell, as well. You're most welcome, Karthik. Okay, thank you very much, everybody, for being here today. I'm sure uh, you learned a lot. Absolutely, I did. And I had some of my doubts also uh, clarified. Okay, I knew this was going to happen. So I was logged in from my other phone as well. My computer has died and we don't have electricity here wherever, wherever where I'm staying, so that's why. Anyway, thank you very much, Dr. Blue, for uh, doing this for us. Uh, this video, this uh, meeting was recorded and we will be uploading this on the official um, YouTube channel of uh, of cell as cell, you can just go for go ahead and look for Society for Endangered Languages uh, and Endangered and Lesser Known Languages on YouTube, and you'll find our um, YouTube channel, and you can subscribe and you can access this very helpful presentation even when uh, later as well. So thank you very much uh, once again, Dr. Blue, for being here, and thank you 